Good morning. Welcome to the adventure this morning. My name is Chase. I'm going to be sharing with you guys this morning what God has been placed upon my heart to share. And I was going to let Christian know, but he left already. Not for Japan, but he is in probably in the lobby doing something. I was going to say, I was praying for him just because he's a Dodgers fan. <laughs> um, but we've been, we've been talking about God encounters and experiencing God in, in powerful ways. And um, we've shared different experiences of people in the Bible who've had God encounters. We've, we've challenged you guys on ways that you can have your own God encounter. Um, I even broke it down on Easter when we talked about the resurrection and how we can experience a God encounter through Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life, right? And so as, as we continue on, we're going to continue on with this series, and I, I entitled this, How Bad Do You Want It? How Bad Do You Want It? A God Encounter. And, and we're going to be talking about um, the Ten of Meetings that was um, shared in, in Exodus, and I'll, I'll explain that a little bit more. But have you ever enjoyed hearing about how others experience God? Or do you truly desire experience God for yourself? How many of you guys have been following, some of you guys have, the, the Hershey's used to do our kids' ministry, and they took a year off to just travel. Any, any of you guys been following them a little bit? I know our kids follow them because they get um, special awards for being able to know where they're at or something in the picture, that kind of stuff. But it's great to follow them and see all the places they're going. It's exciting to do that. But you know what? It's, it's kind of cool to see what they're doing, but is, wouldn't it be better to experience it yourself? Yeah. I mean, it's like, yeah, that's awesome, but I would rather be there. you know. And, and Pastor Ira is all about different restaurants, different food stuff, and he'll come into my office and he'll have this excited look on his face. He's like, dude, I found a new restaurant. <laughs> And he'll go into and start describing this restaurant and, and all the good food that he has. And I'm just sitting there getting more and more hungry, you know. And I, and I don't, as he walks out, I don't go, oh, man, I feel so much better now because he told me all about that, that food that he experienced. I want to experience it for myself. You know, I, I want to taste that food. I want to, you know, the same thing about going on to that vacation. And that's what our desire for you this morning is, is not just to hear about other people's experiences. And we've been sharing experiences in the Bible and hearing about that kind of stuff. And it's great to hear those things and be encouraged by those things. But our desire is that, that you want that desire for yourself, that you want to experience God for yourself. And so that's where we're going to be going this morning. A.W. Tozer said it this way, for it is not mere words that nourish the soul, but God himself. And unless and until the hearer finds God in a personal experience, they are not better for having heard the truth. The Bible is not an, an end in itself, but a means to bring men to an intimate and satisfying knowledge of God, that they may enter into him, that they may delight in his presence, may taste and know the inner sweetness of the very God himself in the core and center of the hearers. And that's, that's pretty powerful. And that's, that's, that's what God desires. He wants this relationship with us that is real, is intimate and powerful. An example I found in our own human relationships is with my own dad. And my dad says, I feel that my son is coming closer to me as he gets older. And yet I've lived most of my life around my dad, right? I grew up here in Utah and then I went away to school for um, eight years. I wasn't in school the whole time. Um, but I went away for, for school. I lived in Louisiana for a couple of years and then Minnesota. And in that time that I was gone, I came back and I've been around my dad. And so you're like, how is that, that growing? And it says, you know, even though I've lived most of my life around my father, what does he mean? He's speaking of experience. He means we're coming to know each other more intimately and with deeper understanding. The barriers of thought and feelings between us are disappearing and we're becoming more closely united in mind and heart. You ever notice that? You know, as a, as a kid, I had this relationship with my dad that was totally different. And I respected my dad and honored my dad, that kind of stuff. But there was a point that as I'm growing and, and, and building this relationship with my dad, that, that, that relationship is changing and, and becoming so differently. And that's, that's the desire that God has for us, is that same type of intimate relationship with us. Psalms 42, 1 and 2 puts it this way. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? 
When can I go meet with God? I want to I say that again and think about that, that statement. You know, my, my soul pants for God. But that last statement is so powerful. And, and is this your heart's cry? Is when can I go meet with God? And I don't mean passing away, you know, like, oh, God, just take me, you know. But it's, it's that idea of, of when, when can I be in the presence of God? When can I meet with God? And so the ten of meetings was set up for that reason, meeting with God. And so we're going to start Exodus chapter 33, and we're going to learn a little bit about this ten of meetings that was set up outside the, the encampment of the Israelites. And what this ten of meetings um, represented to them. And so in verses 7 through 10, um, it's crazy, I have to take my glasses off so I can read. Now Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp, some distance away, calling it the tent of meeting. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meetings outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose and stood at the entrance to their tents watching Moses until he entered the tent. As Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. Whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance to the tent, they all stood and worshiped, each at the entrance to his own tent. So here we go. Brings me to my very first point here is, is the casual observer, okay? And so we know about the Israelites and, and what God had brought them out of. And, and that God was guiding them by a, a pillar of fire at night and this cloud during the day. And so it's saying that when Moses would go into this tent of meetings, that this cloud would, would come down to the, the, the tent itself, and they would know that he was meeting with God. And so what would the people do is they would stand up, and they would go to their tent and stand at the door of their tent, and they would, they would see that Moses was meeting with God. And so I call this the casual observer. The casual observer. Many of us fit this description here as the casual observer. They've had experience, they've experienced miracle after miracle, and they've seen God do miraculous things to bring them to where they are now. And what did they do? They just showed up to see what God was going to speak to their leader, right? We, like the Israelites, are glad whenever whoever's speaking on a Sunday morning has spent time with God and has heard the voice of God and comes to share with us, right, of what God is speaking to our leader, what God is speaking to the people that he's placed up here to, to, to share with us, right? But it's that, that casual observer. They observe what they do and what they say, but that's about it. They were hearing what Moses had to say, but they were just observing him having this experience with God. There really is a commitment. There really is no commitment on their part. They are just joining in with what's going on around them. They're just joining in. Oh, Moses is meeting with God. I wonder what he has to say. Man, that's pretty incredible that he gets to meet with God. And they just can't stand there and, and wait for that, what's going to happen, what's going to say. It's like in the, in the movie, the, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. When Lucy enters the wardrobe and comes back and tells about it, what did it take the rest of the family to believe her? They had to go into the wardrobe. They had to enter in. They said, man, that's, that's great that you experienced that, but I want to experience that for myself. And so that's, that's my heart this morning as I share this with you guys, is that I want, to, I want to experience that for myself. Sitting there asking, how was it? Or, or sounds awesome, but not doing anything about it. Going back to the idea of the restaurants and the vacations. It's great to hear about everybody else's vacations or everybody else's food that they've had, but there's a whole different thing about you experiencing something for yourself and saying, this is incredible, right? So we continue on. The uncommitted, the uncommitted. Back to my even if sermon. A few weeks back, I shared a sermon called Even If. And in this sermon, I stated, at the end of your life, your greatest regret won't be the things you did but wish you hadn't. Your greatest regret will be the things you didn't do but wish you had. It's the way, it's, it's the what if dreams that we never act upon that turn into if only regrets. You say that again. It's the what if dreams that we never act upon that turn into if only regrets. So Jesus was very clear about this when he taught in Matthew chapter 13 on the parable of the sower. 
And he talked about the parable of the sower, and, and it was to a point to it where they even asked, well, what does this mean? What are you trying to get at? And he was talking about the seed that was being scattered, being like the word of God, and being the words that we hear. And he talked about four different types of soil that take in that word, right? And, and the, one, the, the, the seed that fell upon the path, he says, that's those that hear, and they don't understand it. And so the enemy snatches it away from their heart. They hear God's word, but they don't understand it. So the enemy snatches it away from their heart. The second one was the rocky area. And those are who hear it and receive it with joy. But with no root, it lasts only a short time. When troubles or persecution comes, it falls away. It doesn't last. And the last one was, or the, the third one was those that, that fell in the thorns. It was those who hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, choke it and make it unfruitful. They choke it out. And then he talked about the fertile soil. This is falling off my ear. They talked about the fertile soil. And, and that's where the, the fruit starts to appear. That's, that's where the, the, seed, the seed sinks in. And so that's the enter of the good seed. So it takes me from the casual observer, the people that would stand at their tent and just watch Moses meet with God, to the next person. And I call this the young apprentice. And this was a young man named Joshua. And, and Joshua was, was watching Moses and what he was doing. And he just didn't stand there and say, man, I'm, that's so cool that he's going to go meet with God. In Exodus 33, 11, it says this about Joshua. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young A, Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. He's like, I don't want to go hear what Moses and God talked about. I want to hear what God has to say to me. I'm not going to leave the tent. I'm going to stay right here. I'm not the casual observer. I don't want to just hear the, the, the great stories and the, and the great preaching and all this kind of stuff. I want to experience it for myself. This was the young apprentice. What if Joshua was like everybody else and just went to hear what Moses had to say? There's a lot of what ifs that we can think about. What if David didn't take on Goliath? What if Joseph gave up on his dreams? What if Samuel never listened to the voice of God? What if Daniel never stood up for his beliefs? What if Esther had never stood up for her people? What if Timothy refused to be mentored by Paul? What if Jonathan turned his back on David? And then we can go on and on and start naming people in this room. You know, what if, what if Luke? What if, what if, what if Christian? You know, what if, what if Jenny, what if Lance, and we put our own name in that blank, what if I just wanted to hear about other people's experience with God, and that was good enough? But what if you follow through on experiencing God for yourself and what he has for you? The what if. It's never too early to see what God has in store for you. You may not be ready to be thrown into the middle of things and become a star, but you're willing to be an Elisha or Elijah, and, and learn from those around you until you get your chance to, or act, uh, to do even more than Elijah did. That was Elisha's prayer. As he stood around and he followed Elisha around, or Elijah around and he says, I want to do twice of what he did. I don't want to experience God just because he experienced God. I want to experience God for myself and do so much more because of my relationship with God. Think about those people in your own life who have impacted your life. And that's great but say, man, I want, I want to impact other people's lives. I want God to use me like he used those people in my life to speak to others. So what does this take? It takes endurance. Hebrews 10, 36 says this, you need endurance to do the will of God and receive what he's promised. You need endurance to do the will of God and receive what he's promised. And so I took that first letter E and I pulled out the word embrace. And so how do we know God's purpose? God's purpose, in order to understand and endure anything, you've got to have a reason behind it. If you want to endure anything, there's got to be a reason behind it. A reason behind why you're embracing this, why, why you are enduring this. 1 Peter 1.7 says, These trials are only to test your faith, to show that it is strong and pure. It is being tested as fire purifies gold. Faith not tested is only a hypothesis. Faith not tested is only a hypothesis. It's got to be tested. And he goes on. So what does the testing of our faith do? 
And, and, and so it's explained so clearly in James 1.34. It says, you know that the testing of your faith produces, back to that word, endurance. The testing of your faith produces endurance. So endure until your testing is over. Then you will be mature and complete and you won't need anything. Enduring. So endurance is our responsibility, not God's. He's not going to force you into the tent. You have to put time in his presence. He's not going to push you into the tent and say, you need to spend some time with me. Right? He wants that to be your desire, to spend time with him, to be in his presence. So how do we become more than average? How do we, how do we step out and become like Joshua? Joshua wanted to reach God himself. He didn't want to rely on someone else's experience with God. And I, I share my experiences with our teenagers all the time, not so they would want the experiences I had, but they'd want experiences greater than anything I experienced. That they'd want to speak into other people's lives more than any of the lives that I've ever spoken into. That's why I share my experience with them, not so they sit back and go, oh, if I could be like that. No, my desire is that I spark something within them, just like the restaurants and the vacations that says, no, I want to experience that for myself. I want to experience God for myself. I want to see what he's doing in my own life. James 4, 7, and the first part of verse 8 says this, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Meeting with God. And the first part is submit yourself then to God. And what is the first part? Resist the devil. So how do we resist the devil? If the devil, I, I, I tell my youth this all the time, if the devil can't make you bad, he'll make you busy. He'll give you that idea of, you know, if there's a tent right here, I was going to have my, my son set up a tent, but he actually was helping out in kids' church, so he wasn't able to do it. But if there was a tent sitting right here, you know, um, and, and the idea behind this tent of, you know, of, of being in there to spend time with God, one of the things that the enemy will do in, in resisting is, is he'll say, man, I don't have time to go in the tent. I lead a busy life. And to unzip that tent and go spend time with God, man, there's a lot of other things I could be doing that I need to get done. So resist the devil. Resist the devil. Satan doesn't, and this is, I brought an example up here. In my coffee cup, everything is in coffee cups in my office. <laughs> Joe said I should have had bigger chains, which I should have, but this is just more of my example. Satan, Satan doesn't come up and hand us chains to hold us down. He doesn't come up and say, hey, here's, here's the chain of addiction. Here's the chain of bad habits. Here's the chain of busyness. Here's the chain of fear. He doesn't come up and hand us chains. You know what Satan does instead? He hands us choices. As he hands us choices, what do we do? We start making our own chains. Out of each decision we make that's away from God, we start constructing our own chains by every choice that we make. And before long, we're bound by chains. And Satan didn't have to come up and, 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 and wrap that chain around us and, and give us the, 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 the chain of addictions. No one starts out saying, oh man, the first time I experienced something, I want to be addicted to this, right? But they start off with a choice. And that choice leads to another choice, which leads to another choice. And pretty soon, our choices have chained us down to the things that are, that are keeping us in bondage, that are keeping us away from him. And we think of the other way around. We think Satan's out there and he's just going to wrap up, up in these chains and defeat us in this way. And he's like, no, I'm just going to give you some choices. And you're going to make these choices on your own. And your choices are, are to either sit in the presence of God or you can make the choices to go after these things. You can, you can make the choices of to linger on the internet when you shouldn't be. You can make choices to go and do things that you shouldn't to fudge in different areas in your life or in your workplace because those are just, it's just one little link. What's it going to matter? And pretty soon we look around and we are chained down by all the choices that we made aside from God. And it wasn't Satan being obvious and wrapping us up in huge chains. He was just giving us choices. And we wrapped ourselves up in those choices, in those chains. So come near to God. 
The first party says to resist the devil, and the second party says, come near to God, and what will happen? He'll come near to you. He's asking you to do this. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. I don't usually get material from country music, but this song came on as I was putting together my sermon, and, and it kind of speaks in this, this realm, and so from the great theologian, Joey Roll, <laughs> is uh, I only... I only talk to God when I need a favor. And I only pray when I ain't got a prayer. But God, I need a favor. And so my question is, don't let this be the only time you talk to God. You ever listen to people pray at the scene of an accident? Or in the hospital, emergency room? Or when finances have hit rock bottom? You'll hear desperation in those moments. Does it take desperate times for you to pursue God desperately? Is that the only time that we pursue him? Is that the only time that we're trying to get to the door of the tent and you ever got one of those tents and it takes you forever to unzip it? You know, and we're in desperation, so we're going we're gonna to cry out to God and we're trying to get in that tent, but yet God is calling us on an everyday basis to spend time with him. And then our prayers aren't in desperation because we've already been talking to him about these situations. He's still hearing us. It doesn't mean that we can't pray desperately in in certain situations, but it's whole different. I only talk to God when I need a favor, right? So he wasn't on the outside looking in. He wanted to know God like Moses knew God face to face and more. So what were the results? What were, were the results of Joshua wanting to spend time with God himself? If you go into Numbers chapter 13, you hear the story of of when Moses put together the 12 spies. And he was sending these spies into the promised land that God had promised them, right? If God gives you a promise, he's he's gonna come through with it, right? So he sent sent these 12 spies in and saying, hey, I want you to go look at the, the land that God has promised us. And 10 of the 12 came back with a bad report. All they saw was all the difficulties, the things that we just can't do. How can we how can we beat the giants? How can we take this land? But two of them came back saying, dude, you remember God's promise? And one of those guys was who? Joshua, the young man who had spent time with God. He saw things differently. Why? Because he wasn't looking at the circumstances. He had a relationship with God and he, he had talked to God and he looked at it in a different way. And the second part of that is, is, is in, in verse... Uh, I just forgot where my notes are at. And uh, Numbers 27, verses 15 through 20. This is also what happened to Joshua. Moses said to the Lord, May the Lord, the God of the spirits of all mankind, appoint a man over this community to go out and come in before them, one who will lead them out and bring them in, so the Lord's people will not be like sheep without a shepherd. So the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua son of Nun, a man in whom is the spirit, and lay your hands on him. Have him stand before Eleazar the priest in the entire assembly and commission him in their presence. Give him some of your authority so the whole Israelite community will obey him. God says, you know what? You want to find someone? Take Joshua, because Joshua spent time in the tent. Joshua, Joshua wanted to experience me for himself. He's who I want to lead the people. So that's the results. He was appointed as the next leader of the Israelites and also chosen as one of the 12 spies. He didn't go with the flow. He was willing to stand up to his peers and other spies and claim God's promise instead of popularity. When was the last time you stood up for something you knew was right instead of going with the flow? A lot of that is based on how much time you spend with God. So don't leave the tent. Don't leave the tent, but direct my attention on Jesus Christ. Direct my attention on Jesus Christ. If you look to the world, you're going to be distressed. If you look within, you're going to be depressed. But if you look at Jesus Christ, you're going to be at rest. Huge difference. And we live in a time right now that if we look at the world, we're going to be distressed. We look at a time that if we look inside, we're going to be depressed. But if we keep our eyes on Jesus Christ, we'll be at rest because we know who's in control, right? 
Hebrews 12, 2 puts it this way. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him, there's that word again, endured the cross. Scorning its shame, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He endured. If we're, I'll put it this way, can we endure giving God just 25% of our life? Can we endure if we give 50 or 70 or 95% and we hold a little bit back? Or does God want all of us? God wants all of us, right? So how do we endure? If we're giving the world a greater portion of our lives than Christ, then where do you think your attention is at? Right? So what did Jesus do after enduring the cross? Sometimes we miss this part, but it said that after Jesus endured the cross, he went and sat at the right hand of God. He sat in the presence of God. He just endured something so painful, and he endured it for us. And then what did he do? He went and sat in the presence of his Father. So the, the third part, I call this the mentor, the friend of God. And what Joshua did is he chose his mentor well. In Exodus chapter 33, verses 12 and 17, Moses said to the Lord, you've been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found a f- in favor with me. And in verse 17, and the Lord said to Moses, I will do everything you have asked because I am pleased with you, and I know you by name. So two verses there. First of all, Moses said, you have found favor with me. God. And then later on, it says, God says, I know you by name. So for our young people, what's the two quickest ways to get a teacher to know your name? There's two ways, right? To either act out and be really rebellious. And the teacher's always calling like, sit down, Chase. Shut up, Chase. Quit talking to your friends, Chase. Right? Or it's, it's the student that is, is, is man, is, is listening and following through and answering the questions, and the teacher's calling on that person because they're listening. They want to learn. So there's two ways to get to know, get, for, to, to be known by name. And here Moses is being known by name. I won't tell you which one I fit in when I was growing up. <laughs> teachers knew me pretty well. And I actually, actually I had, a, I had there's two teachers that really impacted my life. As a, as a teenager in high school. And it wasn't in school. It was actually in a Sunday school class. And it was a Steve and Wendy story. I still remember this, their names to this day. And, and I, I've shared this story before, but these teachers in this class, um, it was a Sunday morning class, and they were teaching the Bible, and we'd go in this class, and I was disruptive. Crazy, right? <laughs> and, and I wanted the attention on me, not on them. And so my teachers called me out by name, and they said, Chase, we need you to leave the class. And I was like, what? You know how long I've gone to this church? You know who my parents are? You know, all those things that went through my mind. I didn't say those things. But I was like, you can't remove me from this class, you know? But they said, we want you out of here. And so I left the class, and I went to them and talked to them afterwards and all this kind of stuff, thinking it would just be better if I just said, oh, I'm so sorry. And they're like, no, we don't want you back. And I'm like, what? And they're like, this is not about you. We had this small opportunity to share Christ with these other kids, and you're being a distraction, you're making it about you. And it was like, what? All of a sudden, the reality of it f- hit me that it wasn't about me. And that, that I myself, not being a, I wasn't a horrible kid, but I had pulled the attention away from Jesus Christ. And, and, and because of that, that was one of those things that turned my life around. And it was teachers being honest with me that pulled me out because of my influence and said, you know what? God has something greater for you if you let him use you, if you listen to him. And it was around that same time that I got yanked out of there is when I I heard God actually tell me, Chase, I want you to go into ministry. And I was like, no, I want to go. I want to go play sports in college. I want to just have my experience, all that kind of stuff. And he's like, no, this is what I have for you. And it was hearing his voice because I took that time to say, okay, God, I don't want it to be about me anymore. Right? So here it is, a friend of God. Exodus 33, 18. And I, and I love this, this verse. It makes me think of a movie, but 
in this, then Moses said, now show me your glory. I think of Jerry Maguire when Tom Cruise and Cuban Gooden Jr. and he's yelling, show me the money, right? Show me the money. And here Moses was crying out, show me your glory, God. Show me your glory. Show me your glory. He, was in, he, he wanted to experience God. He wanted to be that, that person of God. He waited for Moses to tell him, then this is going back to Joshua. He, Joshua waited for Moses to tell him to wait in the tent or asked him something to get involved, right? No, he didn't do that. Moses never said, okay, Joshua, I want you to go in the tent now and spend some time with God. Now, now Joshua, I want you to do this. Joshua on his own said he stayed in the tent to be in the presence of God. He didn't wait to be told what to do next. He says, God, what are you talking to me about? What are you showing me? He went after his relationship with God. He didn't sit back and see what God was going to do next. He went after God. And we go on to Exodus 33, verses 21 through 23. Then the Lord said, this is, this is God talking to Moses. Then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I remove my hand and you will, you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. So getting a glimpse of God, all you need is a glimpse to be impacted by God. What are you being impacted by? All you need is a glimpse of God to be impacted by him. And Moses after he had got the glimpse of God, actually, you know, before I get to that, is you, you think of another story in the Bible of someone who, who all they said was the, the woman that had the issue of blood. And, and all, she did, all she said was, if I could just touch his garment, just, just get a touch of him, that's all I need. And I know that's enough. And what happened? That desire, that passion, she touched his garment, he was healed. And he felt something leave his body. And, and God is wanting people like that woman to say, you know what, all I want to do is just touch the presence of God. I just want a glimpse of him. And so what happened when Moses got a glimpse of God? It said his face was radiant. His face was radiant. People said there's something different about him. If it's real, you'll want others to have it. And you'll encourage others to go for it. Right? Right? It's like Ira doesn't share about his restaurants because it's like lousy food. He's like excited about it. And, and I, I shared with my young people a couple weeks ago the story of one of my dumb moments in college where I went cliff jumping. And me and my buddies from college, it was on a, it was on a river of all things. That's not the best place to go cliff jumping. It's better in deeper areas. But this, this river was going through. It was in Minnesota. And so we went to this area, and there was about a 20-foot drop. And you had to get a running start, and you'd run, and you'd jump off the edge, and you'd go flying through the air, hit the water, and it was a rush. It was pretty cool. And then there was a little tiny kid that came up and started making fun of us. Like, ah, this is where you guys are jumping? We're like, yeah, this is awesome. And he's like, no. And he says, follow me. And we're like, oh, okay. So it was like five or six of my college buddies were following this little junior high kid up. And he takes us up the mountainside, and we keep climbing and climbing. And he takes us up to this ledge, and there's a tree that's jutting out over the ledge. And he says, this is where you need to jump. And I was like, oh, Lord. <laughs> and so we went over, and you can lean on the tree and look down, and it looked, like, it looked like forever, eternity. And so me and my buddies got together, and this little guy was like, man, we all do this. And I'm like, shut up. <laughs> you know? And he was like, no, this is, this is the best. And so we're sitting there talking, and I have a friend that's not the brightest, and he just turned from our group, and he ran and just jumped, and jumped off the cliff. And I was like, ah, crud, because you know what that means. That means I have to do it, <laughs> right? And so, of course, I, I did it too, and, and all the guys got through it. We did it once. That was enough. But we went back to the college campus, and that's all we could talk about was like, dude, you, you guys got to go cliff jumping with us. They're like, where's it at? And we're like, we'll tell you because we're not going to take you. <laughs> we don't want to do it again. But there was an excitement behind it. We experienced something that was rushing. It was like this it impacted us. And, and we wanted others to know about it and, and to do it also. Corey Tim Boom says, you don't know God is all you need until God is all you've got. You don't know God is all you need until God is all you've got. So his face was radiant. And so the last point is Joshua became kind of a superhero. 
Joshua experienced God and, and God had a whole story that was different than Moses' story for Joshua. And in Joshua 1.5 says this, God talking to, to Joshua, no one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. And this is, this is so pivotal. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Because he was leaning on Moses' experience? No, because he experienced God for himself. I will never leave you nor forsake you. He received his own promise from God. Why? Because he learned to sit in the presence of God on his own. He received his own promise from God. He was given the recipe for his own superpowers. If you read in Joshua 1.8, the recipe for his own superpowers it says this. Do not let the book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. Told him to meditate on the word of God. It means you have to actually read the Bible. And what? You'll be prosperous and successful in whose eyes? Who are you trying to impress? Joshua didn't announce to everyone, hey guys, look at me. I'm going to go sit in the tent. He didn't tell his buddies, hey, I was in the tent. You weren't in the tent. He just went and spent time with God. He wasn't doing it so other people would look on him saying, man, you're pretty powerful. He did it just because he wanted to experience God. And then he goes on and, and he tells them that in, in the same way, in the same chapter, he's talking to Joshua and he, he says these words three different times. He says, be strong and courageous. Courage is the absence of self, not the absence of fear. Courage is the absence of self, not the absence of fear. One person with courage that has been in the presence of God equals a majority, right? So others begin to follow Joshua. Joshua 1.16, it says it this way. These are the others that begin to follow him. I'm trying to find verse 16. Then they, said, they answered, Joshua, whatever you have commanded us, we will do. And wherever you send us, we will go. Joshua now had authority because he spent time with God. So be strong and be courageous. And they said, wherever you have commanded us, we will go. And wherever you send us, we will go. Most of the time, others are waiting for someone else to stand up so they can follow. Which one are you? God will give you your own experience with him. God will give you your own experience with him. And this, is, this was so cool reading this last part, and, and we're going to get ready to close in this part. But in Joshua 5, 13 through 15, Joshua had an experience. And, and in this experience, listen to what happened here. Um, now, Joshua was near Jericho. And he looked up and he saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied. But as, this is what he said, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell down to the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. What other time in Scripture did God say, as he was speaking to someone that was experienced in him, take off your sandal, because where you're standing is holy ground? Moses, right? So here, God spoke to Moses and saying, you are in the presence of God, take off your sandals. And now, Joshua who wanted this experience with God himself is now being told the same thing by God. And I don't think it's ironic that that's mentioned in there. Take off your sandals because where you're standing is holy ground. God will give you your own experience. So what are you waiting for? Someone to ask you to do something? Who are you waiting for? Someone else to stand up first and lead? What do you need to do next? How desperate are you for the presence of God? What chains do you need to disassemble? 
What choices have you made that have weighed you down in chains of, of the things of this life, the addictions, the fears, the doubts? What are the things that you need to start to disassemble to be released from those choices that you made? You know, we have, we have a class coming up, the Concord series that we do for men that have, have made some choices and have been chained by the choices that they made. And yet we do this class not to embarrass anybody, not to, to make them feel guilty, but to say, you know what? We want to disassemble these chains. And we want to help you to recover the purity that God has set up in your mind and revive yourself. And that's why we do the Conquer class. It's for those types of reasons. But going to the title of my sermon again, how bad do you want it? It's time to pitch your tent. It's time to go into the tent. What are you doing to have your own God encounter? It's great to hear the ones we hear on Sunday. It's great to read about the ones in the Bible. But what are you doing to have your own encounter with God? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with, I'm going to read Psalms chapter 27. And as I read this, just listen. I didn't have put this on the screen because I want you just to listen to what I have to say. And it's a little bit of a long, so he's going to play real quietly. But just think about this as I, as I read this. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evil men advance against me to devour my flesh, when my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then will I be confident. One thing I ask of the Lord, and that is what I seek. Listen to this, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle and set me high upon the rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his tabernacle will I sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, O Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, O God, my Savior. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Do not turn me over to the desires of my foes. For false witnesses rise up against me, breaking out violence. I am still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And then it closes with this. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. So we're going to close up in prayer. And, and, and my challenge to you, if you was to stand with me as I close in prayer. And, and I want to challenge you this morning to have your own encounter with God. To experience him himself for yourself, to say, God, I want to put aside the busyness. Lord, I've started to form my own chains and I don't want to be chained down by the choices that I'm making. I want your will for my life. I want to endure whatever the enemy has to, to come against me with. And I want to walk in your will. And if you're in here this morning and you have chains in your life and you feel like you can't escape these changes because of the choices you made, God gives us the victory over our chains. And, and this morning might be a time that you say, you know what? I want to receive God for the first time. I want to receive the freedom that I can have in him. I'm tired of making the wrong choices. I want to go and sit in the tent and be in the presence of, of God. And so that's my prayer for you this morning. So as we close in prayer, we have pastors up here. We have people up here that will, will pray with you. If you want special prayer, they're willing to say, man, I'll pray with you. Right? But my, my, my heart behind this is that we go home and not say, man, I'm so glad I stood outside my tent and heard what God was speaking to Chase. But my goal in this is that you go home and you say, God, I want to be in your presence. I want to experience you for myself. I don't want to live on someone else's experience. I want to know you, God, and what you have for me. So Father God, we come before you this morning. God, we love being in your presence. God, we love singing praises to you, Lord. 
And God, just as all the Israelites, they, they saw you do amazing things. And Lord, they, they even stood on the outside of their tent and they worshiped you. But God, there's something different about being a Joshua and saying, God, I want to just be in your presence. I don't want to have to go to church to be in your presence. I just want to experience you for myself. I want to, I want to hear what you have for me, God. And, and God, I pray for those this morning that maybe have never accepted you before. God, that they would receive the freedom that comes from having you remove the sins from their life by just saying, God, I'm sorry. Come into my life. Make me whole again. God, I want to be in your presence. And God, for those of us this morning that, that, that feel like hey, Satan has handed us chains, but then when we really look at it, it's a bunch of our choices that we've put together that have put us into bondage, that has held us back from who you want us to be, that has kept us from the calling that you have upon our life. So God, I pray that you break those chains this morning. God, that you free us from the bondage the enemy wants to put us in. And God, that you help renew our minds that we start making the choices that you have for us, the desires that you have in our lives. And God, as we just close with Psalms 27, God, I just want to wait in your presence. God, I, want, I don't want to be wrapped up in the busyness of this world. I want to spend time hearing what you have for me. And so, God, we give you this morning. God, I pray that that's the heart of everyone that leaves this building, is, God, I want to be in your presence. I want to be a Joshua. I want to experience you for myself. So we give you this time, Lord, in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Enjoy your long weekend, guys. Thank you for being here this morning. God bless everyone. And again, if you want special prayer, we have people up here, Kuei's up here. We have other people up here that will pray with you. God bless you guys.